Hope everybody had a nice lunch. Good. So now we'll see a nap from 2.10 to 4. And we'll just wrap it up real quick. <clears throat> well. Uh, oh, questions. We have good questions. Questions. What if, you're com what if you've completed your fourth and fifth step with your sponsor, but still have many resentments against your sponsor? <laughs> well, at the bo bottom half of that is true, then the, sec the first half isn't. Then you haven't completed your fourth and fifth step. If I get, if I'm listening to the fifth step of a sponsee and I'm not mentioned, I don't feel like I've been doing my job <laughs> properly. Um, yeah, go ahead and if you've got resentments against your sponsor, go ahead and, and work, do it in a four-step format. I don't think your sponsor is going to be alarmed. I would find it really curious if they were. I mean, if I told him I resent my sponsor because he told me to do this and I didn't want to, and my sponsor, oh, well, just walked out. It's it's crazy. It just put it down. How free do you want to be? Right? You want to walk around feeling like you've been harboring resentments against your sponsor, the person that you defer to, the person that you seek direction and counsel from? Bad idea. Get it clean. Say so. Take care of that. How do I get rid of the fear of letting go? I feel unable to let go of the notion of drinking again safely. Unable to accept this fact. I know I must. So someone's afraid to let go of the idea that they can drink again at some point. When you have a question, what's a good idea to do? Go to the book. Well, I don't need to. The book says... The persistence of this illusion, this belief in a lie that I can drink like a normal man, is astonishing. Many of us pursue it to the gates of insanity and death. Okay? So, if you identify as an alcoholic, but you, you, you can't let go of the idea of reserving the right, that somehow, someday, you may able, be able to drink like a normal man. You may be able to safely drink. I suggest that the solution to that dilemma is to do precisely what it is we're doing. Begin the fourth to twelve step process. Engage in the process. Engage in the process. Wrestle with that is as you go through this process. I don't none of us likes the idea. I mean, I don't I've never met an alcoholic who said so basically here's where it's at, pal. You know this drinking thing that you've been doing? You know, this thing that, that's protected you from the world, the thing that's made it possible for you to leave the house? this source of the only ease and contentment you've ever known, right? Um, this thing that has made all things to this point possible for you, um, it's over and you don't get to do it anymore. <laughs> I've never had an alcoholic get that information and say, oh, well, 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 okay, then, fine. Right? It's a crushing blow to discover that it doesn't work anymore and you're not going to get it back. That's why we've got a portion of Chapter 3. More about alcoholism. That's why the list goes on ad infinitum, as the book suggests, of the attempts we go to switching from uh, um, 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 scotch to light wine, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off with or without a solemn oath. I mean, all these beer to light wine. I mean, all this stuff that we do to try to find a way to make it work. Never drinking before five, only on the weekends. Vowing right to admit oneself to a sanitarium should this blah 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 right we do all that find desperately trying to find a way to make it work the deny the persistence of this illusion that we can drink like normal men is astonishing right so it's a very very powerful influence in us that's why most of us have to be beaten nearly to death before we're willing to say okay i give i surrender so yeah it's, uh, and I completely get the, the notion and the idea that, yes, I'm an alcoholic, 
but I don't know that I'm willing to do this. Yes, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not done yet. Or yes, I'm an alcoholic, but must it be this severe? This, to this total abstinence? How about we just shoot for Friday? I'm good with Friday. Right? We'll drink Friday like normal men. It's a plan. Yeah, yeah. That's a good plan. We'll drink Friday. But, it, but you have... And stop Friday? So begin and end drinking on the, the same Friday? <laughs> You're getting into splitting hairs. You know where this is going, right? If I could drink safely, I would. How do you get rid of the fear of letting go? By letting go and finding that you're still okay. That's how you get rid of the fear of letting go, by letting go. I feel unable to let go of the notion drinking again safely, unable to accept this fact. I know I must. Then by all means, grab a hold of this process and begin to do the things that we're talking about today. Do them. It's the action that brings about the change. I mean, let's face it. Um, you, who are now horrified that I have singled you out. <laughs> this won't hurt a bit. Yeah, trust me, she's looking at me like that. We'll see, pal. <laughs> you can sit there and pretty much assume what it looks like from here, right? I mean, we're in the same room. You've been walking around, you've looked, you, you, you got a pretty good idea, don't you? What this room looks like from here, sitting there, don't you? Right. The only way you can really know is to get up, please, get up. <laughs> Come over here. No, just stay, keep focus on me, stay on me, stay on me. Okay, now. Come on. Okay, good. <laughs> now turn around. A little different than you thought, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. That's a rugged group, isn't it? <laughs> I got my hands full, yeah, don't I? Yeah. yeah, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I suddenly feel like those, I think those magic guys feel when they have the little, <laughs> thank the lovely assistant thing. That was good. I like that. Anyway, you get what I mean? You got to take the action to find out. Like you got to go try and surf to find out about the surf thing, right? You want to, you get, but see, the thing is, is that it doesn't matter what your attitude is, does it? You can think, okay, Earl's on my next inventory for that little episode, right? <laughs> or Xander, oh, he made me, right? Doesn't matter. Or you can think, oh, I wonder where this is leading and be just perfectly fine with it, right? Not self-conscious or anything. We're safe here. We're among friends, right? And, and just kind of exploring, just going along because you decided to trust me and just do this thing, right? And it doesn't matter where your head's at. It doesn't matter if you're afraid. It doesn't matter if it, it, it's hard for you. If you do it, you get a result, right? So I can go to the gym, right, and, and lift weights for 10 minutes. And at the end of this 10 minutes, I look to a friend of mine and I say, you know this weightlifting thing, these weights? They're very heavy. <laughs> I've discovered. And, I, and the, the value of picking up this heavy stuff just to put it back down again, just to pick it back up again, just to put it back down again, over and over and over again, is stupid. This is stupid. I hate it, right? However, with this mindset, every other day I go to the gym thinking, I'm going to the stupid gym. And I'm going to pick up these unreasonably heavy objects repeatedly. And I'm going to go home, I see no point in this, I see no value, this is stupid. What happens? You get stronger, don't you? You go to the gym every other day and pick up heavy stuff and put it back down again, you're going to get stronger. It will, the action that you take will affect a change, right?
doesn't matter what you think about it. Like my sponsor said, you don't have to like this. You don't have to think it's a good idea. You just have to do it. If you do it, take the actions that are suggested here. It will affect a change in your life. So you can be afraid of all this stuff, of letting go of the option of drinking. But if you do this contrary, contrary action, it will bring about a change in your life. You may find yourself looking at it differently. You find, may find yourself relieved of the fear of letting go because you have. And you're okay. And all that you're missing is the component that's killing you. <laughs> Good deal. Okay? I believe I've addressed that. Now, step eight. Step nine. Steps eight and nine. Step eight, made a list. Harmless enough. <laughs> a rather benign step, wouldn't you say? What are you doing? I'm making a list. Of what? People have harmed. And I'm going to become willing to make amends to them all. Now, in the book, a lot of conversation, like I said before, because they're letting me out of the house. I'm going to go talk to people now. I'm going to go expose them to the new wonder of Earl. I'm going to let a little of my light shine upon them. I'm going to expose them to a remarkable spiritual path. How lucky for them. <laughs> I'm always amazed. Are y'all feeling a little lethargic? You ate? And we're all kind of sitting here? Because you got a different energy about you right now. Before lunch, I'm getting a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Bring it on. I mean, yeah. Now I'm getting it like this. I'm getting... That's great, Earl. It's great. It's beautiful. So let's just shake it off, all right? Got to stay in the room. Got to stay here. I had my lunch in three minutes. I ate with many fellas. We had a lot of guys. We went to lunch, right? Everybody got served, was enjoying a lovely meal while I waited for mine. I got mine, wolfed it down. Believe me, I'm fighting the urge to do this. <sighs> but then that's what caffeine is for. Eight and nine. Tricky. Very, very tricky. High wire without a net. Dangerous steps. All right? Follow me closely. Lives hang in the balance. I'm going to demonstrate now. And if I get hurt, I get hurt, and we'll just have to get another speaker. Because, you know, you never know if you're going to make it through one of these, but I'm going to demonstrate the precarious nature of amends. Okay? You ready? I'm very sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I did steal your car. And, uh, and, and I'm sorry. I estimate the value of the car at $10,000 at the time of the theft. If that is acceptable to you, I will give you this check and I will pay you monthly until that balance is cleared and I will not go steal his car and sell it to pay you for the car I stole from you. <laughs> to make amends means to change. So amends is not a get out of jail free card. You know, I don't get to insult you, apologize, and then five minutes later, insult you, apologize. I'm clean. Let's keep moving. I hate you. Sorry. <laughs> right? You never should have had children. Sorry. 
My favorite tent. I'll get into that later. Remind me to talk about Bobby A., one of the great minds of AA, on how to get around this sort of stuff. <laughs> I love the links we will go to to avoid just doing it. You know, except it's in, I make direct demands whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Okay, I'm a I'm a firm believer that I don't go back to the drug dealer that I ripped off. Right. Um, knock on the door of the den itself, go into the depths of the den to Mr. Evil and say, about those two uh, kilos of cocaine, you know, I'm really sorry about that, man. This is, a, this is an idiot in action here. There are other ways. Now, a lot of guys will tell you there's no such thing as a living amends. Have you heard that one? How many have heard there's no such thing as a living amends? Okay, no such thing as a living amends. Okay. Um, I, however, <laughs> um, there are certain things that I do on a daily basis in my life that are uh, uh, in the nature of an amends. Am I clean? Yeah. Do I walk the earth a free man? Yeah. Are there certain amends that I make kind of as an ongoing aspect of my life? Yes, to people who have died. Can you make amends to dead people? Absolutely. Absolutely. Write them a letter. Make the amends. How do you know they're not listening? Right? And is it really necessary that they hear it or that you say it? You know? My side of the street. My side of the street. I'm cleaning my side of the street. I don't pay back people my money. I pay them back their money. My side of the street. My side of the street. I gotta get my side of the street clean. That's what I'm trying to do here. In four and five, I set things straight about the stuff that I'm putting between me and you and me and God. I clean it up to the best of my ability. Six and seven, I hook it back up with God, asking God to remove the defects of character, because I'll remove the wrong stuff. When I'm hooking it back up with you, I'm clearing away the stuff that I put between us. I, it's an amazing capacity, the capacity of this alcoholic to borrow $1,500 from you and to be paid back a week from Tuesday. When you approach me a week from Tuesday, I am insulted at the badgering. <laughs> How I can turn your kindness and generosity towards me as my, into my resentment towards you effortlessly. Right? This is a bizarre way of doing things that I'm quite capable of. i got to get out of this. Who's going to get me out of this? You? Oh, there's a plan. This is a good plan. My life, my life is now, my personal well-being is contingent upon what you do or don't do. That's a good way to live. Right? If I do that, I'm at the mercy of buffoons. I have, I made a pledge in my life, in my amends, in my life, in the attempt to change who I am. I made a pledge to nonviolence. That I am now, and I am not a violent man. I do not raise my hand to other human beings. I don't do that. And that is not contingent upon what you do or don't do. If that's the case, then I'm at the mercy of fools. Right? I'm nonviolent until you come up and say something offensive to me. And then I'm violent. I mean, yeah. prisons are filled with guys that go to sleep every night saying, yeah, you know, I really wish I hadn't done that. If only he hadn't said that to me. Right? It's, it's insanity. If I decide to be nonviolent, then I decide that's my commitment. And it's not con contingent upon what you do or don't do. If I'm going to decide I do this inventory work and I recognize and come to a place where I understand that I am responsible for this and I need to make amends to you from my side of the street. Then that's that. That's what I do. I go and I apologize. What you do with that is not the point. It's got nothing to do with, right? I mean, people say, you know, I made amends to that. You know, I did what you said, Earl. I went out and I made amends and the guy threw me out of his office. <laughs> okay? So the amends thing doesn't work as far as I'm concerned. Sure it does. Did you make the amends? Yes. Did you mean it? Yes. Then it worked. He threw me out. Yeah. That's up to him. That's his decision for him. That's not what we don't concern ourselves with that. This is my side of the street. I must clean my side of the street. I had a, uh, um, Al, he's the guy who's my second sponsor. 
He used to say that he turned his will and his life over to the care of God, and God turned it over to the sheriff's department. <laughs> and he faced multiple felonies. And he faced them, and he walks the earth a free man. He's not looking over his shoulder for any, anything or anybody. He's free. That is the idea here, isn't it? To get free. So, I continue to take personal inventory when I'm wrong properly. Admit it. Ten step. Let me go back. Nine. I make these direct amends. I lived in a one-room apartment for six and a half years because all my money went to making amends. When I came in, I believed that if I were to make direct amends wherever possible, um, I would uh, pay. I would live in this one-room apartment for the rest of my life. All the money I made would go to paying people off. And when I died, I would assign the remainder of the debt to any children I might have at the time. At six and a half years, my sponsor said, you get to move to a nice place now and continue this process, which I did. And it took me a total of nine and a half years to make my amends. And whenever I thought to myself, I've never been to Europe, I'd think, well, when I do go to Europe, I'm going as a free man. When I would think, that's such a nice suit there, I would think, I would love to wear that as a free man. When I would this or that, or I'd meet some woman and I'd decide, I need to shower her with gifts because clearly I alone am not enough. <laughs> I would think to myself, it would be nice to be in a relationship, a free man, a free man. See, I was a slave my whole life from 12 to 28. Every minute of my adult life, I was a slave to alcohol and drugs. I want to be free. So I'm willing to do what's necessary. And as a result, I'm catching the buzz that I'm catching. Right? So, when in doubt, just do it. Just take the next step. You don't know what's going to come. Like I said before, the great news about this thing is, is that whatever it is I know, there's more. So there's a new understanding as a result of new action. There's a new experience as a result of staying the course. All I have to do, if you would think that if I chop wood and carry water and I walk from here to there and back and forth and back and forth, all I'm ever going to get is here to there and back and forth and back and forth. It's not how it works. This one book is not the same book they handed me when I got here. This book is not the same book that I went through for the first time. This is not the same book I went through for the 26th time. This is a completely new book for me. It is astonishing how I can sit with the new ones and say, okay, let us continue. You know, all right. If your man accepts your offer, it should be pointed out that the... Wow, that's really quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> to get over drinking will require a transformation of thought and attitude. We had to replace recovery. But oh, isn't that interesting that I'd read that today? How pertinent that is to my... That little scenario there has just happened countless times in my life. Joe and Charlie's thing, the big book comes alive. Never have I heard of a process described more appropriately. The big book comes alive. It does. It's not black ink on white pages. Over there to be read and observed is something over here on this page. It actually comes to life. And how does that happen? How does what's written in here come to life? It comes to life when we pick up the concepts and ideas outlined in this book and execute them in our lives. That's how it comes to life. That's how it comes to life. When you all come into AA and they say, read about this book, how should I do that? And they say, well, there's people here that have several years, some of them many, many years of sobriety that are conducting big book studies. You think, curious? You'd think at 22 years, he'd have gotten it by now. Maybe that's not why he's doing it. Maybe that's not why he gets on an airplane and flies from L.A. to New York. On Friday the 13th, which by any, any reasonable human would say, that's unreasonable, stay home. My way of looking at things. Why would he do that? He's read it. Stop pestering people. Stay home. No. Bagels and Big Book. Is this necessary? I don't see that it is. It's not necessary. It's just how it comes alive. It's how it comes to life. Because I'll tell you what, 
when I was new, when I came through the doors, when you were talking, what I heard was blah, 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 blah. And I would go, oh, that's very nice, thank you. I don't understand a word of what you were saying. I mean, my head, I say this often, but it bears repeating. In my head, I mean, I would go to Amy's and I would sit and I would say, all right, all right, I found my seat, I found my seat, I found my seat. It's great, it's great, it's great. This guy's up, he's up, he's reading, he's reading, he's reading. He's reading. Re- rarely saw something, rarely saw something. You know, I'm going to have to get one of those books and find out what the hell he rarely saw. Cause, you know, that just kind of went by me. You know, you know, what's going on over there? Oh, 12 things, 12, yeah, those 12 things, 12 steps, yeah. I read the thing on the wall. Very nice, very nice. Yes. And then ABC, ABC, 12 things, ABC, good, good, he's got. I didn't get a lot of that, but you know, I mean, it's fine. Just inside of my head, just bing, 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 bing. Just insane, you know what I mean? Just ideas, beautiful, spiritual, deep principles just bouncing off my skull. You know, just not getting in, you know. You know? I mean, what I, I, all I, I got to go meeting, listen, man, go home, no drink. You know? And pace in the apartment. Jesus Christ, what was that guy talking about? He was talking about something. You know, but what I, you know what? And, and it, was, it was blah, 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 blah. But I'm looking at the guy up there. I'm looking at the guy and he's talking about how he drank. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, that guy's having a very good time. He seems very comfortable being who he is. I mean, the best definition of happiness I've ever heard is wanting what you've got. That guy seems happy. He seems to be enjoying his life. He doesn't seem to be fettered down with all these problems and indecision and you know, I mean, it's clear to you know, people look at me and they think, step back, I think his skull's going to explode. You know what I mean? Just this very tense person all the time. If I was awake, you know, a little anxious. And this guy's comfortable, you know, he's just, he's cool, he's up, he's good, he's good, he's good. And I think, that's an example. I don't know what he's got, but he's got something. I don't know why he continues to be here, because clearly whatever it is you get, he's got I don't understand why, but thank God he's there. I'm going to go ask him how he got that. You seem relatively calm. How? How? Really, you want to know how to be calm? Yeah. I know I'm standing still, but he says, yeah, but you look like you're going about 60 miles an hour, Earl, standing there. Yeah. Calm. Need calm. Help calm. Get calm. Okay, read this. Okay. Now, I could have said, excuse me, I don't understand why reading this is going to make me feel better. I don't get it. Explain it to me. No. Why not? Because you're not going to get that either. I'm speaking newcomerese to you. Like Donald used to do to me. He took me to the meeting and said, Earl, we make six, we make 550 cups of coffee here every Friday night for the next year. You're making them. I said, screw you. I'm ready to kill myself or several other people at any moment. And here you are saying to me, make a little coffee. <laughs> this particular moment in my life. And he said, fine, then drink. I said, you see, there's no talking to you people. I'm trying to have a conversation about this, the problem at hand. I'm being current. And what you give me is make coffee or drink. Fine, I'll make the damn coffee. Now, he could have said, Earl, let me explain something to you. There's this thing called out spiritual service out of self, right? Huge. One of the biggest gifts we have in here. And, and the fellowship we get together, what we try to do is we try to take actions and, and do things in a certain way to, to, to demonstrate what can happen to people around here, the value of certain things. So you're probably thinking, because you're the new guy, you're the grunt, we're giving you the dirty work or we're going to make you make our coffee for us. That's not what's happening. We're giving you a great gift. See, because every Friday night, you're going to spend four and a half hours Get into the meeting, get in the pots filled with water. You go, in the middle of the week, you gotta go out there and you gotta get your little condiment thing together. You gotta get the coffee and the little swizzler things and you gotta get the this and the that. You gotta get the tea for the little tea people and you gotta get the, you know, three different kinds of sugar, the real kind, the pink fake, the blue fake. You gotta get the other, you gotta get all this stuff together. So you got all your table and you got everything ready and you gotta go fill the pots and you gotta put the pots together and you gotta make the coffee and you got everything right. You gotta put the pots in different places so you don't blow out the fuses, right? So you get everything together and you gotta you make the coffee and you got the coffee for the people. And then the people, and then being a little intense, no, right? I got my coffee set up and the guy comes up and he gets the cup of coffee and he puts the swizzle stick down on the table. I'm over there. Yeah, bro. You born on a barn? Pick that up. 
I am running this coffee area right here. <laughs> Unacceptable. People are in the meeting going, dude, the coffee guy. <laughs> What's this, the coffee guy? And the sponsor comes in and goes, no more coffee for you. Because I'm in the back just, because <sighs> I've had nine cups of the turbo pot over here. You know what I mean? They used to say that my, there was a five 100 cup pots and then there was one 55 cup pot. And they used to say about that pot that three cups was a slip. <laughs> I made fierce coffee. What I discovered as a result of doing this, right, was that I didn't get to think about Earl for four and a half hours on Friday night. I was too busy worrying about the coffee and making sure that I didn't screw it up and get fired from AA to think about me. Tremendous relief. I left there every Friday night feeling better because a self-centered guy like me wasn't thinking about me. I was being of service. Out of self, more God. Out of self, more God. The healing was happening. I'm an alcoholic who knows if he drinks, he's going to die. And part of what I do for that is I make 550 cups of coffee for total strangers every Friday night. And healing begins. Now, as a newcomer, if you'd have said that to me, it would have done like most things did. But he, you said, do it or drink. Got it. (laughs) Make the coffee. And I could be angry and just not like it and have a bad attitude. As long as I did it, I got the result. As long as I did it, I got the result. The ninth step is no different. You do it, you get the result. Doesn't matter if they're happy with you, mad at you, doesn't matter. Love you, think you're wonderful. One of the things that I was told to avoid when I did my ninth step was to avoid going out and saying, listen, I'm a sober man now. I'm on a spiritual path. Powerful, you say? I think so. A very, very powerful sober man now. Um, Great events are occurring in my life, and I'm going to share them with you now. And when we're done, you're going to leave thinking, thank God I know that man. (laughs) My life is different. And may I say, quite a great deal better for having known him. The transformation, the turnaround, he is a message for us all, isn't he? Please. I'm sorry. Here's your money back in the house. Get out of this hole. You know, what a, ain't I great? No, I'm sorry. You may, and change, to make amends means to change. Change, I don't do that anymore. I lied to you, you were hurt by it, and I'm sorry. Anything I can do to make this right, let me know. And I'll be happy to do it. And so that you know, I'm really working on the lying thing. Right? Now, I don't know about you, as for the lying thing. I lie. I will lie for no reason. I don't know if you are familiar with the lying for no reason. <laughs> it's a remarkable moment, in, in, isn't it? When somebody says to me, Earl, how are you? Good. What would you do today? I went to the movies. As I think to myself, you didn't go to the movies. <laughs> Why did you tell this person that you just went to the movies? This in no way improved your standing with this person to tell them that you went to the movies. You said, I went to the movies. They went, oh, good. Yeah. There was no point in it. It served no purpose. It had no value. You clearly lied just instantly, out of nowhere, for no reason. And the only thing I've been able to come up with on this, the only reason I can figure that that happens from time to time, is because in some part of me, I'm very, very worried that I'm going to become bad at it. And you never know when you're... You never know when you're going to need a really good one, right? So you just occasionally throw one out there to kind of keep it oiled up. You know what I mean? (laughs) That's the only reason I can come up with. I have no idea why that happens. Many people that I know have had the experience of saying, asking me something, I've answered it. And as soon as I was finished answering it, I said, you know that was a lie, don't you? (laughs) Yeah, we're used to that, Earl. It's not a problem. You know, here's what really happened. That's another great gift in recovery, by the way, is the ability to, the opportunity to (laughs) go to somebody and say, in the middle of a conversation, I'm in the middle of a conversation with you, and be able to go, time out, time out. 
erase everything I just said. I'm, I'm bending the truth. I'm, you know what I mean? I don't like the way this is going. You know, I'm behaving like an idiot. You know what? And the fact is, I'm not an idiot. I'm just behaving like one right now. And I, let's start this over. Now, another recovering person is going to go, wow, that was cool. A normie <laughs> may be a bit alarmed by this. <laughs> Don't be concerned. They get to drink. They'll work their way through it. <laughs> I got to clean it up as soon as I can, which brings us to 10. Now, I believe the action plan to be one is problem, two solution, three decision, four and five me, six and seven God, eight and nine you. Four through nine action plan to bring the solution of step two about in my life. To make it not words on a page, but to make it real for me by these actions that I take. Okay? 10, 11, and 12 keep me in the game. 10 is me, 11 is God, and 12 is you. Because as I go through 4 and 9, I can do this to the absolute best of my ability and I can begin to affect the change in my life. But odds are, having lived the way I've lived for so many years, I'm barely scratching the surface on this stuff. There's worlds within worlds here. This stuff goes as deep as you want to take it. Right? But in that first pass, I've introduced myself to the, the processes that are available there, the principles that are afoot in those steps, the nature of relationships with God, self, and others. I've introduced myself to this. I want to keep this rolling in my life. I want to keep this going in my life. I don't want to do a nice little one-day workshop and then go back to my old ways. I beseech you. How long has it been since someone beseeched you? I beseech you, do not do that. Make a move. Make a move in your own defense, in defense of your own life. Take an action. Do something different. Do something in addition to what you currently do. Add to the mix. Expand, enlarge upon what we already have, right? 10, 11, and 12 allow me to do that. Allow me to keep the ball rolling. 10, me, 11, God, 12, you, which we will explore immediately following the break. Yes, ma'am. I was startled. By... All right, here we go again. We have many things to discuss here. I've got new questions. Ah, also, um, for Annie. Annie, you're not here, um, but I wanted to say hello and extend my very best wishes to you personally, and I hope we meet soon. None of you know what just happened, and that's just fine. <laughs> so, question. When a sponsee says, what happens if I quit and find out later that I didn't have to? <laughs> May I suggest that a normal man would not ask this question? Because a normal man would recognize that if that were the case, all you'd missed was a few drinks. <laughs> In this individual's case, I would suggest if you found that out that you would have missed an awful lot of drinks. <laughs> so, um, I would just simply say, I wouldn't worry about that. Just keep moving. More will get revealed. If you're not an alcoholic and you've missed a few drinks, big deal. If you are an alcoholic and have missed a few drinks, big deal. <laughs> ah, 
an alternative opinion to what I stated about resentments regarding your sponsor. What if you uh, um, do your inventory and when you're finished you realize you still have resentments against your sponsor? An alternative opinion was voiced, which I think is very good, that what you do is, is that you take these resentments and this aspect of your inventory to a third party, an alternate third party, possibly with a significant amount of time, and that you can read this stuff and when you get to your part in it, you can then go back and make amends to your sponsor. Love that. Thank you, Ava. That came directly from a member of the Bagels and Big Book group. Our sponsor. I love that. Earl H. Sponsored by the Big Book. And let's see what this is. So what's with the eyeball to eyeball thing on the ninth step? Like I can't get to South Dakota to make this amends. Won't a letter do? Help. Okay. Okay. Send them a letter. Make them a videotape and send them the videotape. Asking them to burn it Im immediately after watching it. Kind of a, what was that show? I'm kind of a Mission Impossible thing. This all is anyway, isn't it? Um, South Dakota, to make this, some, yeah. Yeah, I, if you can go to South Dakota, go to South Dakota. If you can't, give them a phone call. Read them the letter. Make the amends. Write them the letter. Do what you got to do. Got to be, we're willing to go to any lengths to do this stuff. All right? So if you tell me you can't go to South Dakota, I say, okay, you can't go. But you can get significant communication regarding this matter to that individual, can't you? And be available for their response. All right? So if they have some need on the other end to say something to you about this, that they have the opportunity to do so. All right? Okay. Here's a good one. In the eighth step, how serious does the harm have to be? <laughs> Whoever wrote this, I love you. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, I was shooting to kill, but he was only wounded. No amends necessary. <laughs> you know, I love that. Harm is harm. If you have harmed someone, we don't, we're not, we don't have degrees of harm. Right? Harm is harm. If you've harmed someone, make amends. You don't know that the impact this has had on that particular individual. It's not... We don't decide for someone else how much harm we've caused them. We don't know the extenuating circumstances of their lives. We don't know. I mean, I can um, be goofing around at a party and push someone into a pool, right? And well, all I've done is embarrass that person publicly, and that requires an amends. I apologize for embarrassing you publicly. I had no right to treat you that way, and I apologize if there's anything I can do to set this right. Please tell me what it is, and I'll be more than happy to engage in that, in that activity to see that this is made right by you. Um, however, I might be at the same party and push another person into the pool. It's the same action, right? Uh, that person almost drowned as a child and is deathly afraid of water. And this is a terrifying experience for this individual. Brings up a lot of their past. I mean, it's really, really a, a remarkably unsettling experience to them that throws them into a semi-catatonic state as they sink to the bottom of the pool and someone has to dive in and save them. Did I harm them the same? I did the same thing to them I did to the other person. Is that what it's about? What I did? I make amends, right? I make amends. You make amends. You don't sit there and go, well, you know, they got wet, big deal. I got to make amends to the person I traumatized with the other person. Eh, it's minor. No. Make amends. Harm's harm. Set it straight. Set it straight. It's like, it's, it's like well, you know, I make amends for all, you know, I pay back money in excess of 10 grand. Or I have limited liability in all theft, and I only pay up to ten grand. <laughs> no, <laughs> set it straight. All right. Um, what was the other thing? Somebody else mentioned to me something that I say that was pertinent to the ninth step. Speak up. Where are you? You came up and you shared with me something that I talked about that you said was pertinent. There you are naturally right in front of me, and I couldn't see you. 
Yes. Right. It's like, what's the point and the value of all this stuff, right? When I came to AA, you see, these conceptually, these things all tie together. We may have to go back to the tape and review, but I'm certain that they do. I came into AA and believed that there was, you know, because there was in it for me, the self-centered nature of being new. I believed if I came in and I was honest with you, then you would be honest with me, that this would be the result of my action. Because for me, it was all about the expectation I had on the back end of the, of the action. Do you get what I mean? I'm not being honest with you because that's a good thing to be. I'm being honest with you so you'll be honest with me. That that's what I'm after. I'm still, you notice here, I'm doing the right thing, but I'm still attempting to control and manipulate my environment. You see how I'm doing that? I'm being honest with you only so that you'll be honest with me. I'm trying to get you to give me what I think it is I need from you. That if I love you, then you will love me. What am I, what am I, in, what am I doing this for? I'm doing this so that you'll love me because I need to be loved. It's about me. I'm attempting to manipulate the situation. Right? If I show you respect, then you will be respectful of me. And I was completely wrong. That's selling it, you're selling it short. Way short. If I'm honest with you, the reward is, is that I become an honest man. If I love you, then I become a loving man. If I'm respectful of you, then I become a respectful man. That these are the rewards, it changes me here. What you do with my, because I was honest with you and you lied through your teeth to me. I showed you respect and you embarrassed me publicly for no reason other than to dampen my light so yours would look a little brighter. Not you personally, but you get, get what I'm saying. Though I did find this one question a bit challenging. I'm kidding. Everybody that put a question up here is going, a little shit's talking about me. <laughs> Earl. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? This side of the street. I do this to be this, to become this, not to get from you. What you do is your business. I am powerless over that. One of the great gifts of sobriety, serenity prayer. Remember, the, you know, everybody talks about, God grant me the courage to accept the things I cannot change, the courage of change, serenity to accept things I cannot the courage to change things I can, the willingness to know that there wasn't the difference, willingness to wisdom. This is an example of, of, of sleep deprivation. <laughs> God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the willingness to know the difference. And everybody gets caught up in a lot of that. You know what the, remember what the first three words of that prayer are. God grant me where I seek this, this will all make sense in a minute, where I seek this, right? That's, I have to pay attention to that. What can I change? Me. What can't I change? Norman. God, I have tried. <laughs> to no avail. Norman remains delightfully Norman. Right? It's, I gotta, I gotta focus my attention on what I can do something about. I can't, dis I can't help it if you lie or you don't lie. Right? I can be an example for the newcomer that comes in. I can become a part of the human chain, right? That's Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can be a guy who's doing better and better and better and better. I can be an example to that guy. So when that guy comes in and says, all I hear all is blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm talking about? I can say, oh, yeah. That's all I heard. But, I can feel something here. I can feel something here. There's something that I can feel. It's palpable. It's tan I can feel it here. You people are doing something different. What's the key to that? Doing. Doing something different. You people are living a different way. Your, your act, the action of your day is fundamentally different than mine. And I want that. How did you get that? This. What keeps me... I've worked one through nine. What keeps me going? What keeps me in the game? 10, 11, and 12. I think of them all as action steps. People say, well, you know, there are the action steps, and then there, well, I think they're all action steps. Ten, me, eleven, God, twelve, you. Nobody else to play with, right? Four and five was me, ten is me. Six and seven was God, eleven's God. Eight and nine was you, twelve is you. Nice. That's kind of tight, isn't it? That's kind of covers it, doesn't it? Ten? What am I doing with ten? What am I doing? It's a pop quiz. Come on. 
thought you were going to get to sit there after lunch and just listen to me go on and on and on, didn't you? Come on, what are we doing in 10? Continuing to take personal inventory. Personal inventory. My inventory, not yours. And when wrong, promptly admitting it. Why promptly? Because I'll develop a resentment towards you and we'll get around to it June. Right? I will wrong you and think, oh God, I've got to clean that up. I'll, you know, eventually. I'll make a note of some kind. You know, get to that. Wrong. I've got to get it done now. Resentment's the number one killer of people like me. I will fester and I will die. I've got to get it out of my head. I've got to get rid of it. So I review my day. The book, again, very specific. Start the day, review the day. Great stuff. Great stuff. How do, and you know what? It doesn't even have to be a day. That was a very, very interesting experience for me. I remember being new, about two years sober. I'd been going to Ohio Street um, Monday night, two, no, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night. Four nights a week I'd been going to Ohio Street for two years. Right behind the podium at Ohio Street is about a three-foot by four-foot painting of the Serenity Prayer. Two years after having begun to go to Ohio Street, I spotted that painting. <laughs> and I read it and I thought, you know, that's snappy. <laughs> Loving that poem. It's a poem to me. I call up Donald and go, Donald, there's a poem. And he goes, you mean a prayer? I go, yeah, 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 prayer. Yeah, yeah prayer. There's this prayer I read at Ohio Street. Incredible. Shortest prayer I found. Love it. I'm going to say it now. He said, no, no, you're not. I said, what are you talking about? It's the shortest thing I can find. He goes, no, way too much going on there. You're going to screw that all up. I said, fine, then if I'm not allowed yet to say this, the, 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 this prayer, this serenity prayer, um, what do I got to say? He goes, here's what you want you to do. Here's your prayers. Are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. He goes, all right, when you wake up every morning, before your feet touch the floor, you pull the covers down from your insane little head and you look up and you put your palms up like this and you say, whatever. I said, I like that, that's good. I said, now when you get in bed at night and you get in the bed and you pull the covers up to your crazy little head, I want you to put your hands up like this and I want you to say, enough. And you go to bed. <laughs> and I said, Got it. About three weeks later, 9 a.m. rolls around, and I'm done. I've had it. I called him up, and he always answered the phone. Donald Madden. Donald Searle. How are you, kid? Donald, I'm doomed. He said, how did you spot that, kid? <laughs> he said, I'm done. I can't take it. It's 9 a.m. I'm not going to make it to tonight, man. I'm not going to make it. I'm done. It's over. I've had it. Nice effort. Thanks for your help. I'm a dead man. He says, hold it. I can help. Well, thank God, because you're the one and only call I'm making here. He says, all right, I want you to take a deep breath. <laughs> that was a deep breath for me. When I was a little constricted. He says, okay, now take a deep breath. <laughs> all right, now. He goes, say enough. I said, enough. He goes, okay, wait a second. All right, take a deep breath. He said, okay, now say whatever. I went, you can do that? It's 9 a.m. He goes, so what? He goes, that day wasn't going well, wasn't it? He said, no. He goes, then end it and begin another one. This was like a spiritual experience for me. I'm looking at the clock going, nope, not going to make it. I didn't have to. I just had to let that go and start my day over again. I can do these things along the way, right? That are tremendously valuable to me. These little, little, little ways of getting on through. Just getting from meeting to meeting. Getting from sponsor call to sponsor call. Getting from opportunity to sit and read the book. Let it go, take it back. Let it go, take it back. Let it go, take it back. I mean, I, I, I turn my will in my life. You know how many times I turn my will in my life over the care of God between Los Angeles and New York? I'm surprised over the loudspeaker we didn't hear, 
Uh, okay, Earl, this is God. <laughs> Why don't you just keep it till you land, and we'll get back to it then, okay? Because this back and forth is driving me crazy. Because it's, here, God, bump. Yeah, it's mine. <laughs> oh, Jesus, here, God, bump. Yeah, it's mine. Right? It's just a nightmare across the country. Got me, got me, got me. All that matters is, is that, like Donald used to say, my, your life is like a tapestry, right? That's being, that's being sewn. I guess that's what you do with a tapestry, right? You just sew it. Have I got that right? No tapestry, people? Woven. Woven. I'm writing that down. Woven. <laughs> nice. As the tapestry of your life is being woven. <laughs> My job when the needle comes through is to just push the needle back. Right? That's all I do is just push the needle back. There's another way to put it. The door opens, walk through it. What's in here? I don't know. Why are you walking through it? Because the door opened. Is that reason enough? Apparently. Had a remarkable life happen as a result of just doing that. Another thing. Oh, I'm losing it. Another thing. Anyway, even though I've gone quite mad while standing up here. Um, oh, it went away. Never mind. Yeah, it did. It went away. All right. Well, but no, it just, it's not going to help. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> that fell into the black hole. I just... I'm gone. Yes. Bobby A., step 10. I'm sitting in my first step study meeting with Donald Madden. We're all being very well behaved, right? Bobby's sponsored by Donald. Bobby has uh, um, the most time in the room under Donald, right? He sort of sits at the right hand of Donald, right? <laughs> very impressive fellow about that tall, right? Mighty fellow. We're all very impressed with Bobby. We're very serious about the steps. Very serious. Working the steps. Quiet over there and working the steps. Laughing? There is no laughing in steps. No laughing. Life and death. Steps. We're, reading, we're talking about the 10th step. And, oh, it's very serious. Very serious. Nobody's no screwing around in here. To get to Bobby, <laughs> Bobby says, Well, I recall the first time I heard the 10th step. thought it was fascinating. Continue to take personal inventory, and when wrong, promptly admit it. So I immediately wrote a long letter to a friend of mine, pointing out all of his defects of character, and I apologized for not telling him sooner. <laughs> <laughs> all these serious faces are... Eyes twitching, you know what I mean? What the hell did he just say? Right? Donald's like, ah! <laughs> Donald thinks that's the greatest thing he's ever heard, right? Now we're all like completely shook up. Bobby's looking at us like, lighten up. Just lighten up. He says, that's not how I feel about it now. This is a process. This isn't fine, got it, good, go. It's a process. More is revealed as we go. He says, I don't feel that way about the step now. I preface this by saying, when I first heard it I, w it, I saw it as simply an opening to give this guy a hard time. Got it. Have you noticed we've been laughing a lot in here? We've laughed a lot today, haven't we? It's the healing for us. We've got to have a good time. We've got to play a little bit. We've got to look at the stuff. If we can't laugh at us, we're screwed. Okay, because let's face it. Ripe for some good jokes around here, huh? <laughs> All you got to do is go, hey, I've, let's listen to one another one of Earl's good ideas when he was drinking. <laughs> right? It's like, it's hysterical. We got to be able to laugh at this stuff. Don't get so, I can't get so, you know, Jesus Christ, I'm gonna stop, stop. what did he say? What did he say? Slow down. I haven't got every word here. I'm going to... Because when I'm done, I'm tearing this crap apart. <laughs> Writing you a long letter, pal. <laughs> May call central office about you. <laughs> Get a little AA cease and desist order out on you, pal. 
<laughs> Christ almighty. Right? Put me in your inventory. Who cares? <laughs> Ten, continue to take personal inventory wrong. Why? Because I didn't get it perfect the first time around. I'm screwing up all the time. You know why I'm screwing up? Because I'm pushing the envelope. I'm not leading a safe little careful life. I'm out there mixing it up with the normies. You know what I mean? Occasionally, a little bit m more of me pops out than they're comfortable with. <laughs> and you can see it in their eyes. You know, I'll be, get, I'll, get, I'll be a little too tired, you know. When I get tired, it's like truth serum for me. You know what I mean? All the filters just seem to melt, and I just start telling the truth. And I'll get a little animated, or I'll get a little caffeine in me when I'm exhausted, and I just start going. And every once in a while, I'll be talking to somebody, and I'll forget... They're not in AA, it's just somebody I know. And all of a sudden you see that look in their face, that just that. <laughs> you know, and you go, and you just think, whoops. <laughs> right, went a little too far that time. That sentence is usually ended with, but I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> or sometimes it even happens with new people. You've got to be careful around certain new people. There's been a lot of education in the community over the last 25 years. Okay? A lot of people are getting to AA with higher bottoms. Now, a lot of the old timers, you know, seem to take exception to that. I think it's remarkable. I think it's wonderful. Why should somebody have to suffer as much as I did to have a right to be here? That's crap. If you made it here, congratulations. I don't care if you dropped the champagne glass by the pool and went, oh, that's it, and then you came. <laughs> None of my business. It's not my business. I mean, all the way to the normie coming in and saying, you know what, this is cool, I want to learn from this. Book says, anybody could get a lot out of this. Oh, we got open meetings, why the hell shouldn't we let them come? Encourage them to stay, encourage them to grow. Work with them, share our experience, strength and hope with them. But remember, some of the new ones, it happened the other day, it happened Thursday night. I was sitting in the meeting in the house, step study, little workshop thing you got going on, right? There's a newcomer girl sitting over there. She got about 23 days. And I was making a point and mentioned uh, something I'd done, right, while I was drinking and using. That was, to my way of thinking, a rather moderate tale. <laughs> <laughs> I just briefly looked to my right and realized she wasn't seeing it that way. She was looking at me with absolute horror on her face. Just, And she looked at my wife, and my wife went... <laughs> I don't know if she's going to come back. I don't know. <laughs> Got to be easy with the new ones. Kind of get a sense of what... You know what I mean? We don't want to jump them too hard and too furious. I believe that uh, this isn't a cookie-cutter program. We bring them in, we stamp them this way, we guide them through this, we put them through this stuff and on. I know a group somewhere in the Midwest, they're so serious about this thing, and I mean serious, <laughs> that you come into their group, you get interviewed as to whether or not you're going to be in their group. If you come into their group, there's, a, there's an interview process to become a member of their group. If you join their group, you're advised to take the next 30 days off from work. Now, I don't know about you, but to think that if a newcomer's got a job and then to actually ask them to not go to it is... <laughs> that kind of goes against the grain for me. <laughs> but, the, I mean, and I mean, I, I actually did damn near an exorcism on a member of that group getting them back out into AA. All right? I mean, the pressure that was being put on this woman was horrible. The, the manipulation and control that was occurring. But that seems to work for some people. There's other much more moderate groups that have additional aspects to them outside what one would consider the mainstream of AA. Right? There's people in AA that are incredibly loose. There's a guy I sponsor named Britton. His, I, he came to me and asked me to sponsor him. I said, well, what's up with your first sponsor? And he said, well, he told me to work the steps unless it was a hassle. <laughs> I'm thinking that's not going to work for me. I'm going to come to you. And I said, cool. Right? Well, that guy's staying sober. That guy's still sober. He works the steps unless it's a hassle. God bless him. You know? 
I figured that that could easily turn into I stay sober, unless it's a hassle. <laughs> but that's me. That's not him. Find your way. Ten. Continue to take personal inventory and want wrong, promptly admit it. That allows me to not find myself going into a deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper state of resentment, dis-ease, disharmony, so that because I'm only going to do an inventory every five years, and, you know, right, that that builds over a period of five years until I get some relief. No, I want a, the daily experience of the relief being there, of this working, of being free. I don't want to slowly over time, in sobriety, gradually become tethered once again to the disease of alcoholism. I don't want to end up with the obsession of the mind returning. Now, if there's another guy I know in the program that says, I think I could stay sober and comfortable that way, doing half of the things I do. The only problem is I don't know which half that is, so I just keep doing all the stuff that I do. I'm with that guy. I'm with that guy. I have a great life as a result of what I do. If it works, don't fix it. always gone to lots of meetings. I've always been sponsored. I, I've been sponsored for every moment of my sobriety except for three hours. That's how long after Donald died I had another sponsor. I'm of service. I sponsor a lot of guys. I sponsor some remarkable people. Absolutely remarkable people. And I also sponsor not heads. I sponsor a guy who... Uh, um, He's been around 12 years now. I think he's over three weeks again. And I sponsored him for 12 years. Question. If you have someone who continuously relapses, Earl, shouldn't you encourage them to seek another sponsor? Yeah. And if he doesn't go, fine. It's not my decision. It's not up to me. It's not, believe me, I'm not the weak link in his game plan. <laughs> he has been exposed to everything that is necessary to become comfortably sober and stay that way. He just doesn't choose to do it on a regular basis. So he regularly gets loaded. And then he gets to the place where he wants to put a gun in his mouth and he calls me and he comes back. And when he wants to tell me how much pain he's in, I don't listen to him. I say, let's, I don't want to hear about the problem. Let's talk about the solution. I'm familiar with the pain and the madness. Let's talk about how we stay sober. Then we'll do that for a while, and he'll get relief. And the minute he gets relief, he stops doing it because he's got the relief. And then it goes away because he stopped doing it. That's the part he seems to miss. You get it because of what you're doing. Then keep doing what you're doing, and you'll keep getting it. You stop doing what you're doing, it's going to go away. You with me? That's amazing. All right. <laughs> So, 11. Ooh, we're getting close, aren't we? Getting close. 11. I seek through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. I think it's a self-explanatory step. What do, everybody, what do I pray for? What should I be praying for? How about I pray for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out? Period. The end. Thank you. Why don't I pray for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out? Now, I can pray for world peace. I can pray for a new bike on Christmas. I can pray to, for her. I can pray for all of you. Anything wrong with any of these prayers so far? No. What could I pray for to kick all that into account? Keep me out of the solution. Keep me out of expectation. As a result, keep me out of everything except my part in this. And align me in a position to be of maximum service to God and my fellows. What could I do to take all that into consideration? How about I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out? <laughs> Just right back, boom. Nice and simple. Nice and simple. Pray for that. Can I add stuff? Sure. Can I do stuff instead of that? Absolutely. Donald had a horrible prayer. He'd get mad at somebody. He'd pray for them to get what they deserve. 
That was as gracious as he could be. <laughs> he used to get a kick out of it. Somebody would say something to him in, in a meeting or something that he didn't like, we'd all go, well, you're going to be praying for that guy. <laughs> Knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. That's what I pray for. That's what the step tells me to do. I seek God. It's on me. I don't stand around waiting for God to pr- pr- present himself to me. I seek God. It's an action step. I seek God through prayer and meditation. Now, when I went to Alice after Donald, I oh, sat down and we reviewed my program and he said, Earl, you're firing on all cylinders. You're doing great. You're catching the buzz. You're spreading the word. You're doing the deal, man. You're doing the deal. Love it. He goes, now about this meditation thing. Do you meditate much? I said, well, what do you mean by much? <laughs> I'm coming up on 14 years and actually not yet, no. He says, well, I think you should explore meditation. I said, okay. Being a good little AA sponsee, I was deferring to the thinking of my sponsor. I called up a friend of mine and said, uh, about this meditation thing, I think we need to explore it. He said, great. We found a place that was a school for meditation. We took a six-week course on meditation, and we began to practice meditation on a daily basis. Why on earth would I, a Westerner, a linear thinker, not so much anymore, but at least my culture raises me to be that kind of way, think in a very linear fashion, not to approach this spherically at all. Don't let me get started on that. Okay. Right? I'm here. Right? I meditate to quiet the mind so that when the answers come, I can hear them. Okay? I don't get letters in the mail from God. God doesn't talk to me through the radio anymore. (laughs) But I do get a sense of what the right thing is for me to do when I pray and meditate. The answers come to me in the form of a thought, an idea, an intuition. The book tells me that I'll come to rely upon these things this sixth sense. It comes to me through meditation. Meditation is one of the most powerful tools available to an individual like me. It is not the nature of the body to be still. It is not the nature of the mind to be quiet. When I meditate, I sit still and attempt to quiet the mind. And people are always coming up to me and saying, well, well, how do you do it? I mean, give me, and I say, well, you want a real, real simple, easy way to meditate? Fine. Sit down on the floor, sit cross-legged, and if you're, you know, you got a bad back, or you got this, and you can't do the lotus thing, don't worry about it. Sit in a chair. Just sit down. Sit down, get comfortable, spine straight, relaxed, palms up, in your lap, get loose, get easy, you know, head upright, get comfortable, close your eyes if you want to, if you don't, fine. Mouth slightly open. Breathe in through your nose in in a slow and easy motion where there isn't the sense of breathing. So you're not getting that, but just. And then very slowly, out through the mouth. Just very slowly. It's working already. Two guys just went like this. Right? And you breathe in slowly and you breathe out slowly. Right? Very simple meditation. Count from one to four. One, two, out with two, in with three, out with four. And then start again. In with one, out with two, in with three, out with four. I will guarantee you that the majority of the people in this room, when I just counted from one to four twice, didn't stay with me. You thought about something else. You found some way to object to that. You were in conflict on some level with it. Or you simply just started to think about him or her or it or when or how or under what circumstances. You just went into something else. Because that's what we do. This isn't about getting good at staying on one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four for the next 20 minutes. This is about recognizing when you've wandered off, accepting and acknowledging that, and coming back to one, two, three, four. It's not about staying at one, two, three, four. It's about being willing to come back to it. Because you're never going to stay there. We wander. The body's being still. 
The body doesn't like to be still. The brain subconsciously, well, you're counting to four, will say, tighten up his left butt cheek. And you'll go, one, two, God, my ass hurts. <laughs> Never mind that. Back to one, two, three, four. Back you go. One, two, girl in the fourth row is very attractive. Oh, sorry. One, two, the guy over there to the left laughs a lot. I like him. He seems to be pleased with me. That's all that's required for me to like you. Shit. All right, wait. One, two, you just, right? It's the nature of the mind to scurry about. The body doesn't want to sit still, right? When the glute tension didn't do it, right? It'll say, make his left foot cold. What? Why the hell is my left foot cold? Because your brain's trying to get your ass up out of the chair to go do something. You can't sit still, be quiet. But if you keep coming back to this and just experience your resistance to it, which is fascinating when you think about it, that you can't sit still and be quiet for five minutes. That's alarming. It's absolutely alarming. You start to see the urgent need for the meditation. So you sit and you begin. And this will happen to you. If you do this every morning, it's going to come. You're going to sit down and you're going to count the four once. You're going to open your eyes and it's been 20 minutes. And you're going to feel a lot. You woke up exhausted and you sat there for 20 minutes and you got up and you feel balanced. You feel peaceful. You feel calm. But you feel a great sense of energy. Not the caffeine kick. Right? This steady, smooth, easy energy is there for you. And you're going to go, wow. And you're going to be very, very comfortable with decisions that have to be made that you were really stressing about. Because it's just clear that this is the right thing to do for you. And you can make the decision and then let it go. And not sit there second-guessing yourself for the next two days. You can make the decision and move on with your life. Next. Bring it. Next. And it's okay. And it's a remarkably powerful tool. Prayer and meditation. I seek God through these things. Why do I do that? Because without God, I'm in charge. Need I say more? Bad situation. Earl's in charge. Oh, God. <laughs> We've seen his handiwork. Back to prayer. Turn it over to God. Give it to God. Give it to God. Whatever. That's a great prayer, by the way. Whatever. What does it say? Whatever. I surrender. Screw it. Take it. It's up to you. I'm your humble servant. Thy will, not mine, be done. I'm just going to go out here and attempt to maximize my service to you and to my fellows. I'm going to go to these meetings not to take from them, but to see what I can bring to them so that when the newcomer walks in and goes, anybody in here got what I need? Yep. And it has nothing to do with my best thinking. Good news for us all. That's cool, right? So that's what I do. I seek God through prayer and meditation to improve, to continually, to constantly, to hopefully, without ceasing, improve my conscious contact. Contact at awake. Conscious. Here. Now. Conscious of a contact with a power greater than myself. You bet. You bet. I have relationships with a few of the people in this room. Right? I can assure you that the nature of those relationships is remarkable to me. Some of the stories I can tell you about things that we've done. Right? A buddy of mine that I haven't seen in a while, I saw him last Friday the 13th when I came here. And I said, and he walked in today after the break and I got to see him. And whenever I see this guy, it just lights me up. He's not in the room right now. He's in the back so I can talk about him. So when he comes in, shh. His name is Steve. Right? I love this guy. We never talk. We don't have to. He's on the planet. It's a better place for me. I love him. I just love him. We were sitting on a beach in the Bahamas one day. Right? First of all, <laughs> need I say more than that? Right? This maniac and I are sitting on a beach in the Bahamas. It's Beautiful sands, water, birds, rocks. I mean, we're paradise. Two pagans in the middle of paradise, right? And we're sitting there. This is back when we, we smoked. And I, and I said, uh, he said, so you've been smoking these Cuban cigars? And I said, yeah, 
tasty, huh? Goes, yeah, I love them. It's great. And we're on a, we're, we're, we're on a little island in the Bahamas, and uh, I think it's called Eleuthera, right? That sounds like an illness, you know, not an island. But there we were. Beautiful place. And I said, you think we could get some? Now, there's a couple old dope fiends, right? In an hour, we found Cuban cigars. We got up off the beach, got a ride into town, immediately went to the liquor store. Found a couple of guys. Says, you know a guy that would know a guy that could get us, right? We went, we, we need to tap into the Bahamian underground, right? <laughs> We're tapped in in eight minutes. <laughs> we go through a store to the back of the store to meet Mama so-and-so, who knows the guy who says the word to the bartender over at the club so-and-so owned by the underworld kingpin of this particular island. We go we to the bar, you know, code blue. Great, box of Cubans comes out, right? They open it up. You know, we take six or seven of them, pay the guy back in the cab. Back, We're back on the beach within an hour smoking Cuban cigars. You've got to love this guy. That's history between us. We're sitting there just laughing at each other, right? Oh, have us die hard, Ralph. <laughs> you know, he's just tapped right in and do that. And we had a blast. And that same guy now sit over dinner. And what we talk about is his daughter and how much he loves his daughter and how he's being a good father to his daughter. Right. And then you meet his daughter and you see how she talks to him. And, you know, God, this child's in good hands. <laughs> right. How can I not love this man? Right. Do I need to talk to him every day? No, we're on the same path together. I know what he's doing. He knows what I'm doing. We see each other. The other day he emailed me for the first time and it was a picture of him with a very prominent politician. <laughs> it's hysterical. Standing there with his arm around this politician, right? Talk about worlds colliding, right? <laughs> and I've got this picture and I just sat there and laughed and I had tears in my eyes though about how the world is our oyster, man. And jump in and can have this thing. If I continue to take personal inventory and when I'm wrong, promptly admit it, I stay clean and I can go out there and do anything. If I seek God through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out, if I'm doing that, I'm cool. I can get out there and jump in the game. Now, I got one thing left. But when you look at that triangle with a circle around it, Right? Mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being. Therein lies the balance that I seek but can't find, drunk or sober. Right? And that AA adopted that symbol and unity is the body, I bring it here. I must be with my fellows. Recoveries of the mind, I work these steps. That twelfth step, having had a spiritual awakening is the result of working these steps. Having been restored to sanity, soundness of mind, having been relieved of the obsession to drink and use. Free. Third side of the triangle, spiritual. Service. I can practice these principles in all my affairs, right? Which is what we're going to talk about when we come back. Step 12. Right. All right, I got another question. The question is, how many meetings should a newcomer go to? I, let me put you this way. I, I, uh, do some work with uh, some sober living homes out in uh, my area, about an hour from where I live, and um, they require a lot of meetings. If you're uh, if you're going to uh, um, if you're working full time, they require a minimum of 14 meetings a week. All right. The, the message is this: nothing, nothing, gets in the way to a, of a constant com- connection and commitment to Alcoholics Anonymous. Working full-time, terrific. Then you'll only do 14 meetings this week. <laughs> Get what I'm saying? So those guys are at the 6.15 a.m. meeting, and they go to the 6.15 to 17 a.m. meeting at the 502 Club before they go to work. After work, very easy to hit at least one of the many, many meetings that are being conducted in that immediate area. Weekends, doubling up shouldn't be a problem. So two a day is nothing. The record is held by John C., 54 meetings in one week. So, if you're a newcomer, I would suggest a meeting a day. Suddenly? Doesn't sound like much, does it? (laughs) Go to a meeting a day. Why not? 
I think in the beginning, I mean, what we're doing in the beginning is different than any other time. What we're doing in the beginning is building a foundation upon which we will stand free men and women, free of the beast, free of the enslavement of alcoholism and drug addiction, right? We're building that foundation. I would suggest that it requires constant involvement, right? I mean, I don't want to build an okay foundation. I want to know that my foundation kicks ass. That's what I want to know. So I'm going to be involved on a daily basis. I'm calling my sponsor every day, doing what he asks. I'm going to a meeting a day. I went to him. They said, if, if they had said to me, Earl, I want you to go to a meeting a day for your first five years. We'll talk again then. I would have said, okay, you clearly you're still drinking because I ain't doing that. The fact of the matter is I went to way more meetings than a meeting a day for my first five years. Way more. Because I was doubling up on the weekends. Because I was hanging with my new friends, these sober guys. I was chasing her. She was sober. I needed to look very, very sober. <laughs> All the wrong reasons. I'm building a very solid foundation. Again, what gets you there? People say, well, you know, I don't know if that's a good way to get to AA. Please. I don't care how you get here. Well, I'm here because the judge made me come. Perfect. I got here because I thought it was a good idea. Perfect. I'm here so my wife won't leave me. Perfect. How do you get here and how you get here? What causes you to stay? Perfect. Right? This ain't about the mindset. You're not going to think your way into right action. You're going to act your way into right thinking. That's what you're going to do. Just the, it's about footwork, man. Have the free feet bring the head. Let's face it. When you get here, if you're anything like me, you may have kicked. You may have kicked. You may not have kicked. But you, let's say the worst case scenario, you come here and you kick, go into meetings. Now, you've kicked. You've dealt with the, the lesser aspect of your disease. You're now sitting in AA meetings with a head full of alcoholism, right? Beast is whispering in your ear. Oh, he's look, beast, beast in the going, What? It's, he's looking right at you. Smile at him. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. It's, just, it's going on in here. Fine. You brought him here. The ones that I love are the meetings where you go into and the guy raises his hand and says, uh, Earl, um, the beast is talking to me right now. I mean, it's so loud, I'm surprised you guys can't hear it. <laughs> right? It's absolutely unbelievable because you know the beast has sworn you to secrecy and here you are talking out in plain view of other recovering alcoholics. The beast is like, oh, great, that was smooth. <laughs> right? I mean, if you're gonna, I thought it was between us. If you're going to do this, and we're, you know what? We're not talking. Excellent. Excellent. Bring it on out in the room. I love the guy who shares his hand and says, Bill, alcoholic. Came here today to tell you all to fuck off. <laughs> hate you. Hate alcoholics. And I, don't hate you as a group. I hate each and every one of you individually. <laughs> hate AA. Hate your pedestrian little book. Hate it all. Came here to let you know that's where I'm at. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs> Half the room goes, well, all right, Bill. Way to go, man. Keep coming back, you sorry son of a bitch. Right? <laughs> I love that guy. Because you know what? That guy felt like that at home. And he got up off his ass, got in his car, and went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they said, would anybody like to share? He simply responded and told them the truth. He's not doing so bad, is he? Yes, he has a bad attitude. How shocking. <laughs> that one of us would have a bad attitude. And he's telling the truth. You go back six months later, right? Guess who's making the coffee there? And doubling is the GSR. He is. <laughs> I remember going out to that Tuesday night workshop that I did for five years straight on sabbatical now. And they brought in a guy who was in the house, Big Frank. Big Frank is an Hispanic gentleman. Big Frank been gang banging his whole life. Big Frank's been in the system since he was a kid. All right? Big Frank got ink. Big, first thing you meet on Big Frank is his neck. You know? I walk up and say, Frank, how are you doing? He goes, uh, Come here, you. Let me get, let's get something straight. I am here so that I don't do time. This is why I'm here. 
Mr. Little White Man. <laughs> and I am going to, you say go left, I will go left. I will do everything that you suggest to me to do. I will be in total compliance with the program here at this sober living facility. I will do everything I got, but the minute I got this beef off my back, the minute my case is resolved, I'm getting high. Are we clear? I said, Big Frank, we are clear. <laughs> now, since you're going to be here for a year, what you say you and I talk a little bit between now and then? Whatever floats your boat, little white man. <laughs> Off Frank goes, right? Now, Frank was in the back of the meeting, and every day on Tuesday, I'd come in and say, Frank, how you doing? <laughs> Apparently, that's just Frank's way of saying hello, I, you know? <laughs> Frank and I talked about it a little bit every Tuesday night for a year. I am Frank's sponsor now. Frank just celebrated four years of sobriety. Not because I'm a sponsor, but because Frank was willing to talk about it. Frank was willing to take the actions that were requested of him during the course of that year. And as a result, a change occurred, and Frank is a free man. Frank and I hugged each other and cried when Frank came to me and said, my probation officer has lifted my probation. I'm no longer required to be anywhere or answer to anyone. To which I replied, except me and God. Right, Frank? <laughs> and he said, well, God. <laughs> and he's a beautiful human being. And I love Frank, and I look at him and Frank says, and Frank, Frank this, here's, you walk into a meeting now and when you see Frank, this is what Frank is doing. Okay, I say, here's what you do, man. I want you to read the doctor's opinion, all right? And I want you to read the first eight pages of Bill's story, then you call me right away, okay? And I'm not talking about tomorrow, all right? I'm talking about tonight, all right? All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, right? I got a problem with God? I think not. Big Frank, carrying the message, man. He's fierce. Frank's like, he's like a modern-day samurai to me, man. The guy's huge. He's an amazing human being. Doctor told Frank, Frank, you got to lose some, big Frank got to lose some weight. Frank's heart's about to stop. His vision's getting blurred. I mean, bad stuff happening, right? Frank said, okay. Frank lost 100 pounds. He's still big Frank. <laughs> but he's a much smaller version. How'd you do that? He said, one day at a time, man. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. And how cool is this guy, right? I also sponsor Satan. <laughs> I do. His name is Lewis Offer. Lucifer, that's his real name. Lou Offer. Um, he's got a shaved head and two horns of red hair. Shellacked up into horns. He's got a little beard that swirls down into a point and kind of tips up at the end, right? down about here. He's got a devil's tail tattooed up his back. He's got flames tattooed on his legs like he's standing in the fires of hell. And I spoke at a meeting one night, and this dude comes walking up and says, bro, you got to sponsor me. <laughs> now, immediately, I become greatly concerned about what it is I'm throwing out there. Because <laughs> clearly, Satan sees that I'm his guy, right? <laughs> and I have sponsored him. Um, uh, Louie just celebrated 10 years of sobriety. Louis is an amazing human being. Sponsors a lot of guys, helps a lot of people. When, when those little speed freaks on, on Hollywood Boulevard, out in Hollywood, right? I mean, these guys are 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, and they come screaming into the midnight madness meetings in Hollywood, and I mean just in time. If you can imagine 15 years old and getting here just in time come tweaking in off that street in those midnight madness meetings. Man, they look around and go, holy shit, the devil got sober. <laughs> they see Louis standing over there with the horns and the whole thing, right? <laughs> Louis goes walking over and puts his arm around him and says, all right, little bro, you don't ever have to get loaded again one day at a time if you don't want it. And I just want to cry when I see that. And they look at him and they go, I am so into this. <laughs> right? Now I could walk up to him and say, little brother, uh, my name is Earl. I got 22 years clean and sober, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show you how to catch a buzz that is more fierce than anything you have ever known in your life. And they'll look at me and go, "Yeah, 22 years, right? 
either you didn't use like me, or there's, you're lying. There's a lost weekend in there somewhere. <laughs> they'll believe Louie. They don't believe me, they'll believe him. And they don't know that when they, they, and they pass on me and sit down with Louie, they just move to another seat at the same table. And who cares? They say, we're all going to pass, I'm going to go with Lou. I say, okay. <laughs> I just smile and go, all right. That's a big shift in game plan, pal. Right? <laughs> Right? And we all end up, brothers and sisters, doing the same deal, man. The common problem and the common solution drawing us closer and closer together. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of doing these steps, that was the whole point, having been restored to sanity, soundness of mind, relieved of the obsession to drink and use, walking the earth a free man. What do I do? Because I've been coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and going to these meetings and talking to this sponsor, going to these book stages, and I've been take, 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 take from you which is precisely what I should have been doing. It's taken from you. Right? When Donna looked at me and said, Earl, Earl, it's really not necessary that you share because you don't have anything we want. <laughs> that was a fair and reasonable statement. Sit down, shut up, and listen was really applicable to me. And when they said to me to do that, it was really the kinder, gentler thing to say. If they had said, well, Earl, what do you think? Earl, if my sponsor had called me and said, Earl... Would you like to go to a meeting? Would you like to go? Or, Earl, we're, gonna, we're, we're all going to go to a meeting over here. Would you like to join us? This never, ever happened. I would come home from work, and I'd hit the answering machine, and it would be Donald. Donald Madden, we're meeting at 2nd in Santa Monica at 8 o'clock. The meeting starts at 8.30. You be there by 8. Click. Well, thanks for the invitation. <laughs> I would go be there at 8. The meeting's at 8.30. Why am I here at 8? Because there's people here that are newer than you, if you can believe that. There's people here that know, actually know even less than you. Maybe you can help them out. Get out of your self-centered little brain and help them out. Glad I asked, Donald. Thanks. Go be there for somebody else, right? Oh, okay. And go and do. He would, he'd say, go pick up Ed. He's on the corner of 2nd in Santa Monica, 6th in Santa Monica. Pick him up and bring him to Ohio Street. Fine. Click. I just go and I do it. And what happened was I got introduced to contrary action. Nobody asked me what I thought, what my best thinking was on this. We all knew it sucked. We're going to go with his best thinking. That's the great thing about a sponsor. Use the best thinking of another. That's the, one of the great surrenders around here, to be willing to go with the best thinking of another. One who has what it is I seek. Comfortable sobriety. Someone who's comfortable sober. Somebody who's free. Somebody who's been relieved of the obsession of drink and use. That's what I'm after. The rest of you hear that? Oh, good. That's good. That's good. That I'm getting really, really tired, man, because I'm start the bells are starting. I, if it's just me, I can roll with it. Don't, I mean, I got lots of experience. Oh, okay. Right, we ask people to turn their cell phones off. Thank you. You saw me go away right there. Didn't you, didn't you just see it happen? I remember being in an AA meeting in the back of Ohio Street on a Saturday night, and I couldn't go another step. I was about two years sober. I was done. Saturday night. Couldn't do it. I'm done. It's too hard. It's too damn hard. And I just was caving in. You know, I was just caving in. I couldn't move. And Donald saw me. And the main speaker's up talking. And he gets up. And he walks up to the podium and he taps the speaker on the shoulder in the middle of his talk. The guy steps aside and he gets up at the podium and he goes, Oh! <laughs> and I'm in the back of the meeting. So, fuck. And he, we're having a meeting. Right, okay. Now everybody else in the meeting is going, Who the hell is Earl? Right? Because I don't talk to anybody but Donald. I don't. I never took a chip. I didn't take a kick till I was three years sober. I didn't say a word in AA until I was two and a half. I'm a slow burn, man. I'm a slow burn. But I'm still here. Because every time it came down to the wire, every time a line got drawn in the sand, I stepped over it. Somebody said to me, how can you get through the fear of letting go? How do you get over the fear of letting go? To be able to let go. And I said, you don't. You let go in the face of it. We don't wait till we're not afraid to do stuff around here. 
We do it in the face of that fear. We take action in the face of the fear. That's how the fear gets relieved. You get what I'm saying? It's the action. You don't have to like it. You don't have to think it's a good idea, Earl. You just have to do it. So I do it. I do it all. I have the awakening. I'm free to the beast. The beast leaves. I'm done, right? I'm able to, on a daily basis, engage in the behavior that makes it possible for me to walk the earth free of the obsession of drink and use. I have addressed the obsession of the mind and the allergy of the body. Life's just getting more and more and more miraculous. I've been coming to AA all this time to take, and I've been given precisely what I need. What do I do? I now go to meetings to give. I now take the place of the ones who've gone before me. I now go to the meeting, and I am not there to take from the meeting, but I am there to be of service to that meeting. I'm there to be an example of what can happen. I stand there just buzzing away. And the newcomers come in and go, what's that vibe? Right? Because Fred Ellis is gone. I can't tell them, go stand behind Fred Ellis after the meeting at Thursday Night Brentwood Beginners Workshop and check that buzz out. Because Fred's gone. But Fred gave that buzz to a lot of men. You can go to that meeting now, and there's other guys. There's other guys I can point to. Go listen to him. Go listen to him. When we go to a meeting and a certain guy speaking, and I say to my boys, phaser shields down, boys. This one's safe. Just let it happen. <laughs> Soak this man in. Because he's going to throw down. He's going to tell you the real deal. He's going to talk about trusting God, cleaning house, and helping others. Me, God, and you, right? I was in Texas earlier this year, right? And I go walk in a room, and Cersei's sitting there. Cersei's 92 years old. Been married to the same woman for 68 years. Sober 57 years. Now, AA is only what? 66? Is that right? 67? Last July? Right, June? June 10th? I got a few things left in here. <laughs> Cersei says, Oh, what are you doing here? I'm like, Jesus. Cersei knows my name. <laughs> Hi, Cersei. I have to tell them in tech, they should give Cersei a ring so we got something to kiss when we see him. All right? Because Cersei used to travel. Cersei and his wife and Bill W. and his wife used to travel together. They were traveling buddies, right? Back in the beginning days. Right? And, and I had flashback 17 years. I'm five years sober. I'm five years sober. I've gone to nothing but AA meetings. People are saying, let's go to this conference. Let's do this, 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 this. No, 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 man, I've got to go to a meeting. I was so afraid of changing anything that I was going to get loaded. I just went to meetings. I'm going to meetings. I'm going to meetings. And I took a chance, and I said there was a conference that was like 20 minutes south of where I was living. And I got my little car, man. I drove down there, and I paid my thing, and I went in, and I snuck into the back of this meeting, which just terrified me. There was like 2,000 people in this room. And there was a guy named Franklin W. from Olive Branch, Mississippi, standing up there, Sharing away. And I'm in the back. And all of a sudden, Franklin W. says, I'll sum up Alcoholics Anonymous for you in six words. Those six words being trust God, clean house, help others. And it blew the top of my head off. I had a spiritual experience standing right there. That's, it all fits, doesn't it? All the little things we've been talking about all day. Bam, there they are. Trust God, clean house, help others. Me, God, and you. Steps, the whole nine yards. It's there. It's right there. The action plan. What I do in meetings how I function on a daily basis from the moment I open my eyes till I go to bed at night. Trust God, clean house, help others. I stay in there, I'm on it. So I go vibrating out of that deal and I go on about my life. And I'm thinking, I got this from this guy, I don't even know who the hell this guy is. Trust God, clean house, help others. Franklin W. from Nolla Branch, Mississippi. It's like branded in my brain, right? And I'm going along. 17 years later, I'm in Texas. I run into Searcy. Searcy says, come here, boy. How you doing? Good, man. I'm doing this, doing this. So I said, what's going on? Searcy goes, well, I was just having a conversation with this guy over here. I was talking to him about how... Uh, um, how back in the old days when I was hanging out with Bill and stuff, you know, I get goosebumps. Whoa. Hanging out with Bill. That doesn't come up in conversations a lot, guys I know. Well, I was hanging out with Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, the largest spiritual movement on the planet today. I mean, just an amazing thing that this guy was talking about, right? Because, yeah, we were traveling, we, were, we posed the question because, you know, there was this guy, Franklin W. More goosebumps, Right? Franklin W., oh, it's getting weird, right? We used to go around and we'd talking about stuff, and he goes, you know, he was carrying one of the original circuit speaker guys, and, and, and it, it, it came out of a conversation that Cersei was having with Bill, and he said, you know what? I wonder what it is, what program it is that we will, we will give to the generations that are yet to come. I mean, the world changes. Things change. 
right? What, what is it? What is the common denominator? What is the core, the heart of this thing that we will pass to the future generations that have yet to come to Alcoholics Anonymous? And Bill said, well, that's easy. Trust God, clean house, help others. Get the top of my head blown off again, 17 years later, talking to, well, actually 16 years later, before I turned 22, um, in Texas earlier this year by Searcy. Um, see, the, how, do I, how do you explain this concisely, you know? How do you explain that this is about raising the dead, man? How do you explain how that happens? Well, it's simple. You know, you trust God, you clean house, you help others. Mind, body, and spirit brought together as a whole human being. Therein lies the balance we seek, right? How an individual that's absolutely, completely, and totally addicted, enslaved by alcohol and drugs could rise up out of a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Interestingly enough, something that remains, in fact, a hopeless state of mind and body for the great majority of us. We come into these rooms and we think this, and this becomes the norm for us. Sober people. People get drunk, they come to AA, they get sober, and live happily ever after. That ain't the case. From right here, you could probably throw a rock and hit 100 people for every one in here that knows they're alcoholic, would love to stop drinking, and can't. Because it's got them by the throat. This isn't the common experience. This is our common experience, but that's us. That's not all alcoholics. This is a rare, remarkable gift. And what I'm asked for this incredible, remarkable blessing in my life is that I engage in this process to go steps 1 through 11. Having had the experience, having been given the remarkable thing, having been restored to sanity, soundness of mind, having been relieved of the obsession to drink, freed from the beast, finally, after 16 years of mayhem, I'm asked to practice these principles and carry the message. I'm asked to go back to these meetings that have saved my life, to these people that have saved my life, and pick up the torch that they have set down because they have passed on. To be the one that carries the message of the original 100. To be that guy now, not to be the one who, who benefits from it, but, but be the one who is willing to pass that on. It's the only thing Donald Madden never asked of me. So I'll give you everything I've got. Everything. I'm going to ask one thing of you. When you catch this buzz, when it lights up your life, when it goes so far past not drinking and using, it's blowing your mind on a daily basis. When you catch that buzz, I want you to give freely to the next guy coming through the door as it's been freely given to you. And I promised him that I would do that. And I've honored that promise every day since. Every day since. And he's been dead eight years. Last July 26th. And uh, I will honor that one day at a time until the day I die. Why? Because it works. You can say whatever else you want about this thing, but you must say, and it works. If we work it. The 12th step is an opportunity. What it does is it proves to me that I can view life in a completely different manner. An example, how many of you were forced at some time during the course of your life to stand in lines? <laughs> when you go to the market, you have to stand in a line. When you go to the DMV, you have to stand in a line. When you go to the movies, you have to stand in a line. When you cross a bridge, you've got to wait in line, don't you? May I suggest that you don't have to, that you get to. You're going to wait either way. You can choose to have to wait if you wish. I choose to get to wait. I get to change the way I perceive it, that I get to be a man among men. I'm not locked in a cage. I'm not buried. I've lived two decades beyond anything anybody expected. I ran into an old family friend not too long ago who said to me, you know we're, we're very proud of you. And I said, why? Because pride's got nothing to do with my life. And they said, she's a normie. And she said, well, you know we had to let you go. We loved you, but we had to let you go, all of us. We all let you go because it was too painful to watch and there was no way you were going to survive the course of your life. And we knew it and we accepted it and we let you go. You were 27 years old. I'm 50 now. 
I know you're shocked to hear that because I look so wonderful. <laughs> Heroin is a remarkable preservative. <laughs> <laughs> But you get what I'm saying? Look, it's huge, this thing. This goes so far past not drinking and using. There's a buzz here so powerful. And all you got to do is get here. Right here, right now. See, this is the thing right here, right now that I, I, I lost. That's what alcohol and drugs took away from me. Because right here, right now, I'm, I'm self-centered and I'm afraid. Right here, right now, I'm comparing my insides to your outsides and I'm losing every time. Right here, right now, I can't do it. I'm too frightened. But you put drugs and alcohol in me and I feel like I can function in the world. Ultimately, what it does is it takes right here, right now away from me. I like to think that I like alcohol, heroin, barbiturates. These are a few of my favorite things, right? This is where I like to go down and out. My idea of a good night just sitting around checking my pulse. That's a good night. But if you don't have any of that, I'll take the cocaine, right? Can't go down, let's go up. Because it's not about down or up. It's about getting out of right here, right now. And right here, right now is all there is. There's nothing else. This is it. Now, this is where I'm going to know dignity as a man. This is where I'm going to experience freedom. This is where I'm going to know peace. This is where I'm going to love you. This is where I'm going to feel love. Something I never felt in my life before coming here. Feel it. You could tell me you love me. I didn't, mean, I didn't understand. I couldn't let it in. Now I feel loved. It's an amazing, warm, nurturing feeling. It's like a blanket. It's a remarkable thing. Now. Alcoholics Anonymous gave me back now. Right now. I lost it to the beast. Got it back here. Nothing can happen at any other time than right now. So when I go to a meeting with whatever attitude I have, and I sit down and some guy comes up to me and says, Earl, can I ask you a question? Or thanks, you said this and thanks or that. I feel like I have purpose and I have value in my life. And I came here without either. What I discover in the doing of it and in the being of service and going back to take, give instead of take, is I start to find where the real buzz is. It is in working with the new people. It is in being feeling like I'm in the game because I'm willing to face my worst fear to come here. <laughs> you know? And then I'll get on another plane tomorrow. I landed here and I was thinking about, you know, I've never seen the United States. I could get a car and drive home because <laughs> I don't want to do that again. And I'll get on the plane. I'll get on the plane and I'll fly home. Right? And I'll get home and I'll be exhausted and I'll get up money. And you want to know something? I'm not doing any of it because I'm a good guy. It's got nothing to do with it. I'm not doing it because I'm a fine example of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know why I'm doing it? Because I'm catching such a powerful buzz being one of you. I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it up. I like the buzz. I'm as big a pig sober as I was using. <laughs> I was never interested in the little bitty baby buzz out there. I, you never heard me say, no thanks, I've had enough. If you can say it, it's not true. <laughs> he understands. Right. Uh-uh, man. I never said, no more for me, I'm driving. Never said that. Never. No, no, that, you can have that last little bit. I'm fine over here. <laughs> Shut up. Never said that. And I'm not any different in here. Right? I work all 12 steps in order. I go to regular meetings regularly. I look my sponsor in the eye every Monday night. I do what he says he asks me to do. I say yes to AA requests far beyond what anybody in my personal life seems to think is reasonable. I thank them for sharing. I'm catching a huge buzz. I was exhausted when I got here. I was exhausted. Perfect example. Last night, I'm exhausted. The guy picks me up. It takes an hour and 50 minutes to go to the hotel. I get to the hotel. I go upstairs. My ho you can touch the walls in the room. 
right? There's a single bed, a little TV. I'm very fortunate, apparently, to have my own bath. <laughs> you know, you the lobby's fabulous. But once you're in, new, it's a whole new awakening when you hit your floor, right? This is, and Ava's looking at me like, oh, Lord, just hang with me, right? And I get there and I look at this room and I go, what the hell is this shoebox? Never been in a hotel room this small, for Christ's sake. Bathroom's bigger than the room. How am I supposed to watch that TV from there? I can't. What? I mean, literally, the single bed is half the room. Right? My nightstand is my suitcase. <laughs> with the, with the, yeah. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ. And then I'm exhausted, right? And then the street noise. Apparently, you're all shooting at each other all the time because the sirens are endless. The sirens are going, and the ambulances, and the police, and it's just, and they're all, apparently this is all happening on my block. Because, I mean, I got two hours sleep. But you know what happened to me in the middle of the night? I'm laying there, and I thought to myself, you can look at this any way you want. And I remembered being in boarding school when I first started getting loaded in my dorm room. It's about that size. And I remember being in that dorm room and being miserable all the time. Has nothing changed? <laughs> Earl, has nothing changed? Or can you be quite comfortable here? And I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's warm enough in here. I don't feel cold. The TV, by God, it's a color TV. <laughs> right? The bathroom, lovely. The bed, nobody in it but me. Plenty of room. <laughs> right? Suddenly, I like my hotel room. I was going to go downstairs, downstairs to the lobby. I had figured it out in my head. I would go downstairs, and I would simply say, I'm in New York. I'd try to get a little New Yorkish about it. And I would say, okay, and I'd say, hi, Earl H, 1616, the room sucks. <laughs> Give me another room. Not can you get me another room, just get me another room. It doesn't have to be in this building. It could be in another hotel. Just you get it. I'm not, by the time I got up this morning and went downstairs, the front desk said, how are you? I said, fabulous. I'm fun. I'm kind of high. I've had two hours sleep. I'm going to go sit in front of a bunch of people and talk about strange things. It's going to be great. I feel okay, right? I go to the lobby. There's a couple of people there to meet me. I didn't know them, but I knew who they were the minute I saw them. A bunch of people in the lobby. I went, there they are. There they are. There they are. <laughs> said, How you doing? Good. I haven't slept. Room like a shoebox. It's okay. Let's go. Huh? Look forward to going back to my little room. Very little care is needed to keep it very neat and tidy. <laughs> right? You get that you, you pick your perception of things. What's going to work for you? Life on life's terms is life on life's terms. The 12 step gets me out of myself, has me being of service to other people. Out of self, more God. Whether I believe in God, understand God, irrelevant. It's happening. I can just out of self, more God. Out of self, more God. It's going, it's working, I'm in the world, I'm having fun. I'm allowed to change my perception of everything as a result of this process. I'm able to look at it any way I want. It's, it is what it is, right? I don't have to go into denial and say, well, Earl, that's crazy. You're not in reality here. Hell, I'm not. I'm a completely reality-based guy. But I can see the positive in things where before I couldn't see it which makes my life better. I'm having a very good time, as you can see. Right, right now, my left leg is completely numb. <laughs> I cannot feel my left leg. I've been standing here all day while you guys lounge comfortably in your little auditorium seats. That's why I get paid the big dough to stand up here. <laughs> but guess what all you got today was me look what I got look what I got sure you look it's Margaret you want to hug me? That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. That's not why I brought you here, but that was great. Thanks. <laughs> Look at that. How cool is that? 
That's what I've been looking at all day. Y'all should be up here. It's incredible. But then you wouldn't be able to see you out there, so forget it. <laughs> Look at them. Powerful. Cool. See, they're a powerful group. Those are drug addicts and alcoholics. <laughs> all of them. They're drug addicts and alcoholics. This is Maggie. <laughs> You know how they are? How nice and pleasant they are? Uh -huh. They said, hi, Maggie. <laughs> isn't this nice? I mean, isn't it amazing? Look at him. Look at Norman smiling over there. He's actually hey, asleep. <laughs> He's able to do that. Right? Should be dead. They're not. Saturday. It's raining outside. You stay home on a Saturday when it's raining outside. Right? right. Look at them all here. Who they come to see? A total stranger, a babbling idiot from Los Angeles. We all know those people are crazy. California people. And there they are, look at them, being supportive of me, smiling at me. I love them. Aren't they nice? Nice. Thank you. I get you. I get Tony and Tom. I get Steve. I get all these guys, right? I get Norman over here. I get these guys, the guys that I had lunch with. I had lunch with a bunch of guys. We had this great time, right? Everybody eating. Everybody together. Talking about being alive and sober and free. That's what we're doing. If you're new, and some of you are here, I met somebody with 51 days during one of the little breaks, right? Congratulations. Yeah, there you are. Congratulations, you know? Turn around and walk back in the teeth of your disease. Be involved in something like this above and beyond, going to meetings, you know? It's not required of you, but there's a buzz to be had here. The people in this room are the ones that are getting it. There was a woman who came to me. It was great, too, and I get, I, you give so freely to me. The last break, I'm walking up, and I'm talking to Jackie, and Jackie goes, you know, the way I, the way I do it is, I think that when I, when I pray, I'm talking to God, and when I meditate, I'm listening to God. And I thought, I love that. I've got to pass that on to them. That basically is how I got all the information I've passed on to you today. It's from others who walk this path with us. Everything I've got. None of this, I didn't come here with any of this. I got it here. So it's available to all of us. We just pass it around and share it. It's our truth. It's our experience. It's our journey. So participate as best as you can. Be a part of this. Laugh with us. The healing. Have a good time. Revel in it. Don't take yourselves too seriously, but take this very seriously. Right? It's got to be fun, man. Make it fun. There's only one thing in this book that they say they insist on. We absolutely insist upon enjoying life. That's the only thing in here that they insist on. And I suggest that that's precisely what we should do. So when you find yourself unavoidably in a line, you get to be in the line. When you find yourself unavoidably in traffic, good, you get to stop for just a little bit. Right? More music. More quiet. The options available to you. When you got here, weren't you the kind of person that when you were in the apartment, the TV had to be on at all times? When you're in the car, the radio has to be on at all times? God forbid you should be left with the sound of what's inside your head. You've got to be distracted at all times. How nice now to be able to drive down the road and just be quiet. Right? I kept saying that the place that I'm trying to get to in my life is that when they say, Earl, we're going to put you in this little box and we're going to put you there for 24 hours. You can take everything you need to be happy, to have a great time, to, to, you, can, you can take anything you want with you into the box. Just give us the list and we'll give it to you. For me to have a blast in the box, all I need is some water. That's it. I don't need anything else. I've been trying to get the list as short as I can possibly get it. So I can be happy, joyous, and free without the need of outside components. Me, from the inside out. My mind. Get to be me in there. Comfortable. Having a good time. Digging it. Catching a buzz. What do I need? A little water would be nice for 24 hours. But that's all I need. That's a cool thing. The list used to be extremely long. It's not anymore. That's freedom for a guy like me. Right? I'm, just, I'm fine. And it's a result of being with you. I hope you got something out of this. I've really enjoyed being with you and I wish you peace. I'll see you soon.